So welcome, everyone, to our second public lecture this semester with our guest, Raj Rewal. Raj is a distinguished Indian architect, urban designer, and educator. And in addition to his talk tonight, uh, we're very pleased to be hosting an exhibition of his work in our gallery, which you're all invited to visit afterwards. And I'm sure um, Raj would be very pleased to walk through the gallery with you in conversation. Um, Raj's work has been shown uh, widely, uh, including in places like Parma, Italy, at the National Gallery of Modern Art in New Delhi, and it's recently been acquired into the permanent collection at the Pompidou in Paris and uh, the MoMA here in New York. So we're especially uh, privileged to be able to bring it to our students and colleagues um, this fall, at Roger Williams. Um, and before I introduce Raj more fully, I want to take a pause to say thank you to our hardworking exhibition team. Uh, and this includes John O'Keefe and Heather Wilson. And, and to our student model builders, Chris Norcross, uh, Connor Ashenault, and Evan Cordova for really excellent work on the beautiful models and graphics that you'll see out in the um, gallery. I want to also say a special thanks to our own Hassan Khan, who invited Raj um, and his wife Helena to be with us this fall. And knowing that it's Hassan's final semester, um, <laughs> final semester at this school, uh, before entering what I hope is a really glorious retirement, I want to say that it's been a pleasure serving with you on the events committee. <laughs> So now let me just say a few things um, about our speaker. Raj Rewal studied architecture first uh, in Delhi and then in London at the AA and at the Brixton School for Building in the late 1950s, a really rich, um, fertile time for architecture. And then he went on to Paris to work in the office of French architect Michel Ecochard, who was both an architect and a full-fledged urban designer. Um, we might even wonder or say that Raj's courage to think and design at the urban scale um, might have some roots in those years uh, in, in his work in Paris. Um, nonetheless, in 1962, he returned to India. Um, and at that time, Le Corbusier was uh, accomplishing some completely new things in Chandigarh. And that's when he decided to start his own practice. In, in his subsequently prolific career, since then to the present day, he's designed a huge range of project types, including low-cost housing, educational and research institutions, a library, museums, offices, private homes, a games village, an embassy, just to name a few project types. Particularly striking, though, is his ability to successfully operate within a larger scale of architecture. Um, projects like the Asian Games Village or the State University of Performing and Visual Arts, which are both on display in the gallery, show just how adeptly he's handled campus scale design, harmonizing the whole while simultaneously producing enough masala, as he calls it, uh, or a variety uh, of ingredients while still weaving a sensitive, uh, weaving in a sensitivity to context at the architectural scale. So his approach to design responds to the complexities of place and time, the climate and the culture in a really unique way. And although he studied architecture in the West and he's, his work is unmistakably modern, um, Raj was significantly influ influenced by the built heritage of India. Through his teaching and through a two-year exhibition project that he was involved with um, that set out to document and display traditional works of architecture in India, he developed a hands-on ap appreciation for the spatial configurations, materials, and formal vocabularies of traditional precedents. Um, and he's always believed that the raza, uh, or the spirit of each building type, should evolve from its site, program, and its symbolic concerns. And that's very deeply rooted in India. And his quest to find the appropriate raza really relies on the use of architectural elements like you know, space, structure, light, materiality, sustainability, um, all fundamental things that we still continue to study, explore, and teach, and work with as architects. Raj's work has been published widely, including in monographs in English and, and French. And he's the recipient of numerous accolades, including the gold medal from the Indian Institute of Architects, 
the Mexican Association of Architects Award for Regional Values, notice the global influence, um, and the Great Masters Award by the JK Trust for a lifetime contribution to modern architecture in the post-independence era in India. So with that, please join me in welcoming Raj Riwal. Thank you very much, uh, Nathan, for your very kind words. And I'm very happy to be here. I was here 10 years ago, I think, and when there was a seminar, and I liked the very pleasant environment of the, your school of architecture and the university and the whole city. So I'm particularly happy to be back here. And uh, I had the pleasure of having both Hassan and um, Stephen White in Delhi at some stage, and uh, I know they are, uh, uh, they all already understand or know about Indian architecture and uh, the wonderful book which um, Stephen has done about uh, uh, what's called uh, uh, Buildings in the Garden, um, about Joe Stein, who has been a little senior to us and has always had a very in, um, sort of interest for us when we uh, when I first came to, 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 to work in India, because that showed that some very good works could be done in India. And let's say, so in a way, uh, Corbusier at one time, Louis Kahn another time. So India was a very fertile period for a young architect to come in. So I think uh, I'll show some of my work. But the, what I would like to point out is that we are living in a very diverse world. Is it? Uh, we are living in a very diverse world. Uh, you know, I mean, with very heterogeneous political systems, uh, uh, also uh, levels of development, rich countries, developing countries, and all that. But at the same time, I think we have seen the world being connected very sh sharply, or uh, very suddenly, uh, with the iPhones. I could talk to my office yesterday, uh, computers, internet, etc., which was not there even 10 to 15 years ago. So the more we are getting connected, the in a way, diversity is also happening at the same time, in a way. So it's a very uh, interesting period in the whole world. And for some of us who travel a lot or see things, uh, what I would like to uh, point out that this diversity is uh, what I would call the plural modernity. Because they, there has been one uh, or maybe two or three uh, sort of uh, lineages on modern architecture. One from, let's say, from the Bahu school, uh, which uh, um, as you know, Mies and Gropius, uh, when they came to Europe, uh, uh, from Europe to America, uh, how it flourished. Then the other school, perhaps, which we could uh, consider is maybe Alvaralto. I was very surprised to see his works because they were distinctly different. Uh, so he brought to the modernism another, uh, another kind of works which were, uh, let's say, diverse from the mainstream of modernity. Now, I hope that uh, the kind of work which I'm going to show is another strand, another kind of plural modernity. But the roots of my works, though of course influenced by maybe, uh, as you can see, perhaps a little bit from Kahn and um, uh, much more Corbusier and even Joe Stein, but I evolved in another direction, I imagine. Uh, that was from the traditional Indian architecture. Uh, I think uh, uh, I'm showing here one image uh, um, which is from Fatehpur Sikri. To my opinion, uh, the modern architecture started here. Here is a, uh, let's say, respect for the materials as found, stone, and variety of structural system which went in. 
I mean, if I was to talk about it, it would take a very long time. So I'll quickly go over uh, uh, the the plan of it, which actually I I was responsible in a way for measuring it. Uh, Patap is here, some of the very young architects who worked. So we w spent two years of our office time to measure part of the traditional Indian architecture. Now, the British architects had done some buildings individually, but this is the kind of, uh, uh, you can say, the perspective which we drew as we went along to search of certain values which were inherent, a series of interconnected courtyards, uh, buildings which have deep shadows built into the grain of the structural system itself. Uh, so the first lessons of ecological architecture, how to be very cool uh, in, a, in a very warm climate, and also when there is winter, how to go up on the roof with, to enjoy sunshine, etc. Now, this is another palace complex in Udaipur. If you ever go to India, I don't think you should miss this one, because it's also something which shows the relationship between the building, the landscape, its surrounding, in a very um, sort of almost like a romantic uh, uh, way. But I mean, the, these are, uh, as you can see, the, the, the trees, plants, they all sort of fuse together, all of these things. Now, another facet of Indian architecture is a temple in South India. Uh, you could see about, let's say, on one particular weekend, about almost half a million people, and how how the strate strategy of movement within the building, the 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 pond, the structure. I mean, these. So these are the sort of thing we I started measuring. But here is another example. I think a wonderful example of modernity. It's a building to observe. Uh, the stars and planets, and it's called, uh, actually it's an observatory, and I was very happy to note that both Corbusier uh, talked about in their letters when they wrote, he wrote to his wife, and also he used some of the elements in his building. So, I mean, this is part of the observatory. So I think uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is there is another strand of modernity, and I think it'd be very interesting if, uh, if, if it can bring something to the modern architecture, another, uh, another way of looking or building, another way of designing and considering. Now, this is the building on the left is by Latians, uh, and who, when he built in India, he has started with the idea of showing what he said was the superiority of the Western art, science, and culture, uh, to sort of very assertive, aggressive way of uh, building. But by the time he had finished, he had started copying the Sanchi Stupa top, uh, because his wife had almost become a kind of a Buddhist or um, theosophical society, and he used the railing from the same thing, uh, from the Sanchi Stupa, another wonderful uh, building. Um, built maybe 300 before BC. And uh, uh, the Michel Ekushab, for whom I worked, had been to India before. And he said for him, this was the first truly great monument uh, uh, comparable to the best things done by the, the Greeks um, in um, um, Pantheon, Parthenon, etc., the Roman buildings. Anyway, now. Uh, another uh, image which you see uh, from the Jodhpur fort, as you see the city laid out. Now, the city actually breathes through small lanes and courtyard. I've just been to Spain again, and Torido is similar thing, Segovia. So all the um, countries which have a certain climate. So that's it. They're a walkable thing, which pedestrianize spaces. So which we are totally missing in the modern architecture. And when I, uh, this is the plan of the Jason Mayor, which again we had measured. Uh, as you can see, the space between the buildings. You can see the spatial arrangement. Uh, these are all made into wonderful, uh, we made very large 
drawings of all of them, which were shown at the Festival of India in Paris. Now you can see the three-dimensional aspect of it. I mean, in a way, then there is similarity with Renaissance Italian sp uh, spaces, but also very different because they are very homogeneous. Because all one city built only in one sandstone. So if if you ever get get to India, please don't forget to um, go to Jaisalmer. I mean, I wrote about it at that time, and it became especially in the French architectural magazine, and it became quite a hit. Now, small kids speak a bit of French to take the tourists around, <laughs> so to speak. And now you can see the facade elements. These are prefabricated elements, actually, believe it or not, of that period, and all uh, which the uh, residents bought from the craftsmen to be used on their facade. So there is a tremendous homogeneity uh, in the whole city. Now, these are the sort of influences on my works, and I'll show quickly a spectrum of my works, uh, which uh, I would start with National Institute of Immunology. Now, uh, the program here was for the professors and scholars and uh, research people to be staying next to where they were actually working, doing the research. And so these are sort of elements of uh, the central one which you see is a small auditorium space, but the roof is hung, and the roof is actually utilized for, at, at least on some occasion, uh, by Dr. Prant uh, Talwar, who was the um, Patap's father, so uh, who gave me a very free hand uh, to, to build it. And uh, we could use these spaces for musical evenings, etc., because we didn't have enough money to make another uh, theaters, etc. So this is the model, uh, actually. Uh, now I think in the MoMA, perhaps this one, uh, uh, you can see the uh, sort of space, small courtyard, but which are all linked together in a way uh, around uh, the central building, which is a scientific research institute. Now these are the some of the uh, routes which we had established very early in the project because it was built in phases, how you go from one courtyard to the other, the elements of surprise and central spaces. Uh, so actually these are elements I learned more from traditional Indian architecture, but developed a vocabulary of design which is of course totally different uh, based on materials and potential for what can be built at this stage in India. You can see, now the other problem was, when you're building very diverse building types, how to have a homogeneity. Uh, this was a major problem for almost all my buildings because they are becoming larger projects. So as I said, between urban design and architecture, there's another category which I would call epic architecture. Uh, epic designs, which are very large, done by one architect, to have a certain homogeneity, but enough changing variation, enough spice in it, so that there is a, uh, I mean, almost like, as I sometimes describe, like a narrative long novels, like War and Peace, which has many chapters, which are uh, several stories strung together. So you can see this building. Uh, this is a, actually a cafeteria, which you enter. Uh, this is the space around it. I mean, this is the kind of thing. You can see small spaces which you can sit around. Now, you have a wonderful weather today, uh, but in winter, I believe it's very cold. But I mean, in Delhi, I think uh, um, we could use the open spaces much more easily, like in Italy or Spain. You can see now these the buildings and the plants have grown up. I mean, this is the situation now. I mean, it takes about an um, hour and a half or two hours almost to go around the whole project. Now, this is the first courtyard which I had built. And uh, uh, in a way, perhaps, uh, in, in Indian modernism, this may be the first example, if I'm, if I'm not bragging, <laughs> uh, which is owes totally to traditional architectural uh, values from learned from Jason Mayer. Small courtyards. Roof terraces, 
and uh, even the punctures and the windows, but they have a different vocabulary of design. You can see. Now the material I chose was from sandstone grids applied in situ on the site. This is also very unusual uh, uh, for the time, but uh, the craftsmen got, got used to it rather than having prefabricated elements uh, plonked on. It was cheaper, easier, and faster to build this way. You can see um, um, the kind of spaces uh, from across the courtyard, looking ac across to the, the views of the surroundings, because I think perhaps, uh, uh, I'm sure some of you have seen Alhambra, how the, the views are focused on to the external thing. So I think this is another uh, aspect of which I uh, used in my buildings, uh, the spaces which lead to, um, let's say, this is a small uh, amphitheater, which is a courtyard built around the scholars' hostel. This is the building plans uh, uh, thing. This is the uh, scholars' hostel with rooms built into it. Uh, these are the professors' housing around another courtyard. So these are the section, the duplex uh, units for the professors. Now, I think Indian, Indian government at that time had to entice many of the scientists who work here, the Indian scientists, to come back. So they gave them these kind of houses or kind of this kind of uh, uh, environment to live in so they could come back. Now you can see this is the second phase of construction. I was getting more confident and how the light is diffuse, structure becomes a little bit more uh, uh, um, a, a part of the landscape, etc. You can see the second phase of the model. I think you have the drawings in the uh, exhibition, so you can spend some time. So these are the inner streets and uh, uh, with complete shadows. Here we started mixing that the professors and the students can live uh, in the same kind of, uh, let's say, apartments, if you like, low-rise density. And I think it, it's, uh, uh, it, it was quite successful in a way to mingle them so they can uh, probably like each other or hate each other more <laughs> if they are staying so close. So this is the kind of vocabulary I go a bit faster, but you can see the diffuse, the light is uh, very different. And I had, how to diffuse it was a very um, intriguing process of both learning from the past and using it. You can see the series of interlinked courtyard around the housing. Now, this is a totally different kind of a project. Uh, this is the library for the Indian parliament. This is the imperial complex designed by Luttians and Baker. And uh, it's a grand avenue, um, central vista. And uh, my job or my work was to relate the building which you see on the upper left with the Baker's parliament building. So I, to, it was an architectural competition which I had won, the library for the Indian parliament. Now the library complex also you have uh, I really like to thank all the students who had worked on the model of it, and I think they may have uh, some intriguing questions about it. And uh, this is actually a Google image of it, uh, of this one. And uh, uh, so let's say uh, my work was in a way to, to be both compatible with Latians who had been so aggressive, and also at the same time to show certain what I would call the Indian ethos. So the building on the top is, uh, is in a way much more inward looking rather than imperial columns uh, which come from, let's say, and also to relate to it in a manner. And the, this is the roof garden of the, the building, as you see the complex. So this is the plan of it. I think the plan they are making, I don't know if they're any students, uh, they're doing it in a different manner. Uh, but the, uh, I sort of designed uh, the buildings around the three courtyards and uh, 
the very different elements to break it up into s smaller segments to be a bit more humane because coming from the housing which I was doing in a way that uh, seeped into this sort of discrete monumentality of uh, doing this building to be compatible with it but at the same time quite different. You can see the kind of spaces. So really the building merged with the old uh, Baker's building but it has its own courtyard, garden and uh, a, a new vocabulary of design. This is sort of different courtyards. Well, as, as you know, as an architect, we have to sell our project. And I said the three courtyard represents equality, fraternity, uh, the three aspects of the Constitution. So, and actually, uh, this caught up with the politicians as well. <laughs> and you can see. Now, this is the entrance hall. and. Uh, Another idea which I had, and I don't know uh, how successful uh, it was, the idea of enlightenment. Let's say if uh, Latians was trying to sh show off something else, I took the idea of enlightenment from Buddhist and Jain uh, buildings, where the light is the most um, important uh, thing. I think if you ever go to Ranakpur temple, you can, you can see how to, so the building is sort of these are the small domes which are lifted above on the column, and the light pours through this glass brick sometimes. And you can see the central space uh, uh, with the glass dome and the, uh, the, the floor, which is really, a, uh, again, a sort of Buddhist petals, uh, which uh, uh, sort of symbolize the idea of enlightenment, I think. Most Indians would probably understand that. Now, I'd show another project, Lisbon. This was, again, an international limited competition, and uh, which uh, I surprisingly won. And uh, uh, you can see uh, the, uh, it has a series of uh, courtyard from the entrance. Uh, and it owes a lot to the, uh, um, I think, uh, not only the Indian precedents, but also Alhambra, uh, how you enter from thing, the series of interlinked courtyard, how they open into e uh, one space into the other. So let's say it's a kind of modernism, which is very different from what has what is being done elsewhere uh, by, by uh, my contemporary architects in the world. Now, I use the stone vocabulary from Leosh, uh, from Lisbon, uh, which is, uh, uh, and I use its texture in a very different manner. Uh, and as you go along, the idea of garden becomes very important, both inside and outside. And uh, now this is the uh, hall, uh, prayer hall. And, uh, um, the structural system owes a lot to what, what is popularly known as Islamic patterns. And uh, as in the Islamic buildings, you're not uh, supposed to have any, uh, let's say, figurative elements. So I depended entirely on the geometrics of it. And at the same time, I was very uh, understood that I had to, it's a sacred space, and I didn't want it to look like a gymnasium or something like that. I mean, this is a very uh, important thing for us architects to consider. Uh, and I have often used the word rasa for it. What should be the spirit of the building? Uh, and in this case, I, I thought uh, we use the granite and the stainless steel flesh together. And uh, it was, a, um, in a way, uh, you, this is the prayer hall inside. You can see. Uh, so the vocabulary, totally modern, in fact, uh, I could even go further and say it's very innovative structures, both for the facade elements as well as for the roof. Uh, um, I think uh, if I, it take me a long time to explain the fragile construction of granite, which is strong in compression and steel in tension, and how these could be combined together to have a very light stone structure 
uh, overlooking the the courtyard. Now this is the roof structure. These are the ferro cement domes with uh, with st stone cladding as a permanent shuttering, uh, but the contractor chose to use it in a uh, build it in a slightly different manner. But as you can see, the patterns owe a lot to what I thought was, uh, uh, I don't know, Gironima and the quality of light within the buildings is very different. You can see the structural system here. This is a small mural done by my son who passed away at some stage. And uh, you can see the granite uh, elements, which are almost like a, I was, uh, because of Spain and Portugal are the stone countries which have a tremendous tradition of building in stone. I mean, compared to the rest of the Europe, they did not make, make false ceiling of uh, stone inside and had the wood covered. So I think I could draw upon the, the, the strength of their stone uh, building and cutting techniques, etc., to make a very modern building. You can see the joints. You can see. Actually, now the trees and plants have grown up. It's very different. But you can see the bare structure and the structural system of bracing, uh, bracing steel, stone, and granite together. You can see the steel cables to see that the building, uh, which is very light, uh, does not move in the both direction. Uh, this is another very large project, uh, which is uh, almost uh, hun not hundred percent complete. But here we use two uh, the, the all the elements, particularly now uh, photovoltaic panels uh, on the roof. But I go back to the old Sarnath structure of a university circular uh, element, and also to buildings in Bologna, the oldest university. So to draw upon it, and also, of course, the Oxford uh, University. So I mean, the scale of this project is very large. Uh, it's, uh, these are the f four very different components, like the School of Architecture, Fashion Institute, Film Institute, and uh, of course, the design, textile design. So here, I used an element on the roof, which is a photovoltaic panels, but it's also a symbol uh, um, it's called, called Dharma Chakra, or uh, in the Buddhist uh, mythology, or uh, their uh, um, circle of living, right, rightful living. So I thought the photovoltaic panels would be a very good symbol for our times, and I've used that on the roof. But in that, uh, I think in the model and the section which you see in the library would explain it better than I can perhaps on this lecture. But you can see in the model, it's a, a project which, was, uh, which has a lot of very diverse elements, but fused together by uh, the sandstone building uh, using the material which is similar. Uh, and I used the red sandstone for individual buildings and the white sandstone to denote what was common to all the different diverse schools of architecture. You can, this is the plan of it. You can see what, during the construction, uh, the, the project, the scale of it. So this is what I meant when I said the epic works and uh, how to uh, fuse together very different elements and and at the same time to have a certain homogeneity. I mean, you can see sunken um, spaces for seminars, outdoor spaces. And I think I'll finish with this is the kind of ambience which is there. the sections of it. I think those of you who've been working on it and uh, still need a little finishing there. But this is the amphitheater within it and actually being used. 
Now, this is, uh, uh, let's say, fashion design overlooking its courtyard. And uh, because it had uh, two very large exhibition halls and uh, spaces for it. Uh, I'm showing one little one significant image from Corbusier's building, the use of light. Because I think for us architects, at least as I see for myself, we can imagine almost everything which we are going to do by the time you reach my age. But the light is still very difficult to visualize, how the building would have, what kind of light they have, and how the light percolate, how it would change the design element. So I think uh, you can see the, the, the foyers which I've created. And even for me, it was a surprise, and sometimes a good surprise, sometimes, oh, is that going to be like that? So you can see. Um, uh, so it's a, this is the kind of, s suddenly the light which, uh, 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 which becomes, which changes the architecture altogether. This is the fine art school with an auditorium within it. And I think uh, this is the interior of the library because the topmost floor, I think you will see in the sections of the library. Uh, I have not shown that. Now, I think, I don't know if there's a time. Uh, I will have another 10, 15 minutes before. Uh, this is a very unusual complex, even for me. And I had, by that time, I, the university, I thought, you know, had done enough work. But uh, somebody said, oh, you have to do this project for us. It's uh, Jangi Azadi is really a freedom struggle uh, complex. Actually, colonialism has been uh, one of the biggest major event in the history of mankind. For 250 years, India was uh, under the British or part segments of India. And Punjab was the last province which they actually uh, um, uh, take, took from Ranjit Singh in, after three battle grounds. So, this is built in Punjab to for a cologne uh, to what was the freedom struggle, and you can see uh, some of the worst events were when Jallianwala Bagh. I don't know if you know historically when people were massacred, totally innocent, and even the British, uh, even the Churchill, who was very imperialistic, apologized for that. But you know, I mean, it's not accepted in India. Uh, now, my inspiration for this project was the, what we call the Golden Temple. I hope some of you have seen it. And other monument from Sanchi Stupa, uh, the, the Mughal uh, structures with their domes and marble. And on, on the right, uh, even the uh, Pantheon, which is actually a memorial with a nice little uh, rooftop circle and how the the light dances across. So it's very diverse elements, which, uh, uh, and also in Punjab, the, it's a very dynamic uh, part of the Indian province. You can see uh, the fabrics are patterns of petals and uh, dancing, very di dynamic. So I took these as the elements of my design. So these are the preliminary. Um, uh, computer model sketches, if you like. Uh, again, you can see the uh, flowers as a structural system, I thought would be nice as a homage to the, all those martyrs. And as, as you can imagine, the very vast scale. And the, um, the elements of design, entrance hall, a minaret, which has a uh, place for the martyrs uh, uh, to, to, to pay obeisance to them. And of course, the final structure. And uh, these are some of the images. Uh, the building is still not complete because the landscape, landscape is a major element of design. And I think you will see the in the exhibition the, the the construction and the section elements much more than I'm showing here. But uh, 
use of stone, amphitheater, detailed sections, and this is the entrance hall. Uh, it's the first time I used marble, and I was very worried about using marble because marble uh, had very different connotations, and, uh, and uh, in a way the white is sacred in Punjab, most of the buildings, but uh, uh, at the same time I was a bit worried to use this uh, white uh, because the white sort of looks very different in the night and the evenings and the uh, thing. Uh, uh, it can be, you can see the entrance hall, because this is a big tradition. As you enter, you see the focus on the major elements as in the entrance hall. I think Hassan would probably recognize it more. You can see the roof structure, the light, and I think You can see it's beginning to work a little bit, and I think I will stop with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You want to say something, Stephen? question. <laughs> uh, let's put it like that. Uh, my background is very much as a uh, with great interest in structures um, from my school university days and uh, in fact I've done uh, one of the structures I've not shown which is one of the largest space frame in concrete 256 feet. So structure has been the basis of a lot of my work and I think expression of structure itself, I think, is very to be uh, to become uh, the big basic ethos of the whole building. But now the collaboration between the architect and the engineer, I think, is your question. I think that's. Uh, but essentially, once you uh, the design architect has to establish before the structural engineer comes in. But the once the some structural engineer comes in, he begins to uh, point out certain aspects, and it becomes then a dialogue. Um, I always call it like a musical di dialogue because the structure jugal bandi is the word which we use in India. That uh, the uh, it becomes then a flexible at that time whatever your thoughts were. So you begin to take on from the structural engineer once he runs his numbers, then he says, oh. Uh, your uh, your elements are not going to be 12 inches, but maybe 14 inches would be better. 
and I'm having problem with the, I'm talking about the another structure where he uh, begins to uh, say, okay, the steel rod will not run through, so we need something. But uh, let's say the structure of the Lisbon Ismaili Center, I had, when I had given the design, uh, it was already established, the, whatever the numbers were. And when I went to uh, the structural engineers, uh, uh, I wanted Overhoop to do it. It's one of the world's best known. And they were a bit worried about an earthquake zone, uh, whether we can actually do it. So finally, I hit upon uh, um, a Portuguese engineer who's the head of the department. And he, read, he ran through certain numbers. And then he said, you know, granite is not an element which is, which which can be uh, quantified, because its grains run in different manners. So he actually tested one element, uh, one unit of it, and then we established that granites of only particular type would be used because for compression the strength, uh, because there is no record of it. So, but the, stain, the use of steel and stainless steel, et cetera, members was probably um, fairly easy to do it. And uh, by the time we uh, had established it, I think he was quite confident to go ahead with it. So in a way, the architects have to conceptualize and very well, and I think it's very good to have structural base very strongly. And I think the, the British system in which I studied, and let's say the major architects like Foster and uh, Rogers, they all come from the same roots of having a good structural base to their uh, thinking. I think what's happening in the world, because this is a question I uh, see go, we are very, very much discussed, uh, where I last gave a talk. Uh, you see, what's happening now is there is a, one is a star system that the architects um, do signature buildings all over the world. That's one thing. Then what is happening is the financial constraints or dis disciplines, if I may use the word, in different parts of the world are, uh, let's say, f as somebody said, form follows finance, uh, uh, is becoming very important. In, in So let's say the, when the building, let's say, let's take the Renaissance period when the, um, uh, let's say, the uh, society in which the um, not only the king, but the dukes and all that, who were very well uh, knowledgeable about the arts, would commission money was not such an important issue, etc. So let's say, uh, often when we are designing these days, is for the committees. Let's say, uh, for the university, there was a committee. They had established the rules, and you build it. And this was the discipline of the money. You can't exceed it. If you do, the building will stop. So, so you have to take, uh, what I'm saying is that these are the financial constraints in different parts of the world uh, um, uh, are there. But for me, the, the major uh, theoretical aspect of the work, which is I have not touched in this thing, is what I call the rasa. I mean, I think you may be, some of you, it's almost word become part of the English dictionary now if you the rasa means ambience or flavor or even the spirit of a particular building so when you start designing what should be the let's say the expression or rasa or even if i would to exist what should be the soul of a building let's say i go even further to when you are designing something like uh, uh, structure for a colonial freedom struggle 
what should it be? You can do anything. I mean, the client gives you carte blanche, you, you have the... Um, so it's a big responsibility at that time. Now, I would say certain kind of architects would just what they had done last and um, do up uh, more of that. The, for me, it has been, as you can see, in the, they are very different, all the three, four projects from, let's say, the university or the parliament library and this. They're very different because I started from the base of thinking what should be the rasa or what should be the spirit of each building. So maybe they are designed by one architect, but they have very different forms, diff very different, actually, ambience as you go in. I mean, uh, Lisbon Smiley Center is totally different from what is within the, uh, let's say, Parliament Library building. I mean, and they are also very different from uh, the university project or the freedom struggle. So this is what I mean, pluralism, if I may bring uh, to the uh, modern architecture movement, uh, a certain different spirit of doing the building, uh, theoretical base for it. Uh, I don't know if I answer your question. Yes? You say there's a great diversity. A little louder, sir. So, but if you look at, if I look at your architecture, there's also a great consistency in the architecture. Over 40 or 50 years in, in India, you use um, what I would always think is a kit of parts. You've got the courtyards, you've got the garden in certain ways, the materials that you use, you almost, most of your buildings seem to have sandstone in two colors. Uh, you mentioned that you use it for the surfaces of the gardens, the walkways as well as a building. So it's, it's a, in, an interesting thing because I would almost say that if I went to India, I would recognize around Rewild building. Yeah, you talked about signatures, uh, signatures, in a, signatures in a building are not necessarily what we should be aiming for. I would agree that there's a great variety of spaces and different places, but there is the idea of this modular, there is an idea of a certain kind of materiality about this space. So I sometimes when I look at and I'm not counting Lisbon and I'm not counting places outside, but in India itself, whether it's up in the Punjab or North Central India, uh, Delhi, and all that, that there is this consistency over the years, over 40, 50 years. So to me, it's almost like an exploration you want to do. And it gets better each time, it gets more refined. But it's, it's a language that you seem to develop for your architecture. Do you have a comment on the fact that this is what you see as an Indian, Indian architecture, or modern architecture, the kind of all the What do you think about this idea that a lot of your buildings are the same thing? I think what you say is maybe partly true for institutional buildings, which are, uh, let's say, four-story, five-story high. I mean, I, uh, I think uh, uh, making courtyard is uh, maybe not a very original thing. It's come down. But from ecological point of view, it really makes sense. So let's say long before they were talking about sustainable architecture, 30, 40 years ago, I found okay, that is the way to go about it. And it's worked out very well because the temperature control by having, using the courtyard is really you bring down the 10, 10, 10 degrees, so to speak, in a very hot climate. It, it makes sense. So that's one thing. Now the second thing, the use of material, materiality and craft. I think, uh, let's say, the glass is a, often synonymous with modernity. Then in Dubai, they are making huge glass towers, which doesn't make sense to me. Because uh, uh, um, when you have a 50 degree temperature, so stone I found to be, uh, let's say, uh, maybe I was the first one to use in the modern m movement in Indian architecture, uh, but I found it, uh, uh, let's say, from three points of view, very pertinent. First of all, uh, 
my first building, which you have seen, which I've not shown, is the brick and concrete. So it was a little painful for me to clad them because too, true, true to material was the sort of uh, ethos of my generation. But suddenly to clad it with stone, it was a little, I mean, let's say, uh, I was a bit reluctant user. But then if you have an air conditioning building, you need an insulation over and above brick and concrete and I thought stone was very good because especially with a gap and uh, I have not shown it the World Bank building is the first one and they definitely wanted uh, American clients because the temperature should not be uh, you know we always use uh, insulation so I devised that why not have stone as a surface material insulation in between so that was another reason to use stone the third one, uh, believe it or not, there are such good craftsmen in stone in India. I mean, may, may I, I would say uh, perhaps in Lisbon they were very good. And uh, stone, I mean, it's a shame that they have not built in stone in, in, in Spain. I mean, it's, I mean, it's because the fashion is not to use stone. I mean, so I reverse that, I mean, for me, it was stone became a material for, as I said, institutional building. But I have done, um, as you see, STC building is very different. And the building I have done in Calcutta doesn't use stone because it's so far from that, which I have not shown. So, but I'm more or less uh, pro uh, using very much photovoltaic elements and element of design. And to, uh, so I don't know if in future my, or the last few buildings would be recognized because I have used photovoltaic panels right from the beginning as a design element. But perhaps you are right if somebody <laughs> associate my work with courtyard and stone. I'm very happy about that. Yes, please. A little louder. Okay, you see the, um, uh, let's say, I would use the word minaret because uh, tower is the mina, minar. And uh, when the client first proposed that we should do the minaret, I was a bit, uh, I, I said, you know, it's not used in modern architecture. I mean, I come from, uh, <laughs> I have, uh, and I said, uh, Maybe minar is a phallic symbol because that's how it was described in the historical, uh, I don't know who's the, I don't remember the theoretical. So I didn't want to use it. But he said, oh, you don't know. Minar is a symbol of victory. And uh, so you, we have to have it. And that's where the, uh, we will have the flame for unknown martyr because uh, it's not recognized that more than, I don't know, more than 20,000 people were killed during colonial uh, period. I mean, different battles and massacre. Everybody knows about Gandhi and peaceful part of it, but there was struggle going on partly just before the British actually took over. So that's the use of the minaret in this case, a symbol that ultimately those who sacrifice have won if I may. And I think it's understood, it was not even understood by me, but my client, a very venerable Sadarji, said, that's what I want. And that's what he had. And it's recognized by uh, children, everybody comes there and, you know, and uh, I imagine that on, uh, that the Golden Temple is visited by some people like half a million people 
on a weekday, Saturday, Sunday. Now we are beginning to have 40 to 30,000, and maybe one day we would have. So that's why that wall space going towards it is designed like that. As somebody who's had such a, a long spanning, really successful career with an architecture, can you speak to what you see as the most maybe enriching or fulfilling moment in a project, whether it's the designing phase or, or seeing the project completed or any part of it? From you make it so safe yeah, in your long career. That's a very difficult question. <laughs> what is satisfying? Uh, uh, um, okay, at a very lighter level when they have paid us. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but the I th I think the I think the uh, when the construction process is going on when you visit the building series of fit and uh, uh, that's also that's the most satisfying period and also very f uh, you uh, you begin to think oh it could have been done a little better so it's both satisfying and also a little it has little problems at that time you are uh, you are being very critical about oneself that i had imagined two or three things but this is what is being built maybe it could have been done that way the way i thought but generally speaking, during construction, I think the finishing, when the building is finished, it's, it's, it's somebody, uh, maybe you visit it after three or four years afterward. It's satisfying if the clients say they were very happy about it because uh, your own emotional, um, emotional um, touch with the building somehow fizzles out kind of thing. Perhaps the, when you're teaching, that's the best part of learning, because you have to make sure what you're teaching, you see. And I think the first four or five years of being a professor was the best part of my learning and for myself, because I had to teach very suddenly, very diverse subject, and our history teacher emigrated to New Zealand or something, and overnight, the head of the department, somebody stronger than <laughs> Stephen, said, you have to teach history. So I said, well, look, I've never studied Indian history. I've come from Europe and uh, blah, blah, blah. She said, no, but you are, he said, but going away, that I could teach history. And that the only reason was that my wife was very interested to visit everything. So we had a car, and we went to see all the historical monuments. So uh, we had seen all the surrounding buildings. So that became the sort of uh, trigger point for the uh, head of the school to say teach. And when you're teaching, you read all the books, uh, you, you have different points of view, and uh, then you have your own point of view eventually. So I think teaching is a wonderful uh, process of learning, and also I think our friend who asked about the structure. I had to teach structure design, theoretical structure design. And uh, believe me, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, 
the wonderful book written by some others on conceptual structures and all that by Italian, I forget his name. So you become very engrossed in it and question when yourself and you're teaching others. So I think teaching is the best process uh, of learning. And as you begin to build your building, you learn from your own buildings, oh, I can do this next bit better, so something. So the process of um, both uh, teaching and your own designs lead you on to something, uh, I don't know, progress further.